All right, Maniacs, today we are going to be reacting to another production, Tales from Hell. I'm really enjoying the series, and you guys got the last one up to 100 likes, over 100 likes. So I said, if we get the videos over 100 likes, I will continue doing reactions to these, and I'm going to continue doing reactions to these. And guess what we're doing today? You guessed it from the title. The original Exorcist. This has to be top 10 favorite horror films of all time. It is so damn good. The atmosphere is oozing from this movie. The performances are Oscar contenders, in my opinion. I mean, so much greatness came from this film. And uh, maybe not so many great sequels, but the original one is still to be... It's a classic. It, it, when we talked about the Amityville Horror, when I say this is a better film than the Amityville Horror, oh, I mean that with flying colors. It, one of the best movies ever made, in my personal opinion. Just the risks it took, phenomenal. Guys, hit the like button. Subscribe to the channel if you're new around here. If this video gets over 100 likes, I will continue to react to production tales from hell. I'm really enjoying them. So let's go ahead and dive into the video. We're not going to waste any time. And I'll give you guys my thoughts during and, of course, after the video. What an excellent day for an exorcism. Forgive us, Father, for we are about to explore sin, or rather uh -huh. possession, and the cinematic influence of Satan himself. In 1973, the world was subjected to a film that would go down as one of the scariest ever made, The Exorcist. It explored the corruption of innocence and defilement of the human soul and would make history as the first horror film nominated for an Academy Award. Ten of them, in fact, two of which it won. But with the highs came the lows and the tragedy well deserved. and the curses. Today, we're exploring all of that on this episode of Production Tales from Hell. Yeah, before really getting into it, The Exorcist has to be top 10 scariest films I've ever watched. Um, and not, not saying it's like the scariest I've ever seen. There's a movie that obviously that takes the cake uh, from it, just experience and overall three, through rewatch. Re uh, the first time I saw The Exorcist, it unnerved me a lot. Yeah, it was very unsettling. And then I would say the uh, second time I watched it, I just really started to enjoy the film aspect, the filmmaking uh, part of it. Don't, don't get me wrong, it's still creepy moments in the movie that still hold up till this day. I mean, the scene where we see uh, the priest's mother walking down those steps in the middle of the city and then like, or like walking up them and then walking back down always used to unnerve me. And then you see like that, that quick glimpse of Pazuzu's face really used to get under my skin still kind of no still does to this day i just find it completely unsettling or when like the the demon is like impersonating his mother damien i think is the name yeah damien uh when he's impersonating damien's mother oh my gosh it is i'm gonna take my glasses off i don't need my glasses all the time i don't need my glasses all the time but those moments for sure really uh get under my skin and of course there's so many more scenes i can talk about that are so iconic obviously the the twisting of the neck and then the guy that was killed, voice coming through. <laughs> wow. It's just a brilliantly made movie. Also, based on true events. Uh, but not, it wasn't a girl, it was a boy. And maybe we'll do a separate video on that. But the true story is rather interesting, too. Production Tales from Hell. Hey everyone, it's your twisted woman here, Chauncey K. Robinson, and welcome to Production Tales from Hell, where we dive into all the fire and brimstone it took to make the horror films we know and love, and in some cases, the darkness that followed their releases. In this episode, we'll be focusing on one of the most controversial films of its time, 19. Do you know what she did? The <laughs> there are five circles of film hell. Development, production, post-production, distribution, and perhaps the most dreaded, Limbo. The Exorcist developed under the guise of real demonic circumstances, featured chaos and physical harm during production, and has a distribution story filled with vomit, lawsuits, protest, and danger. The movie not only got in bed with the devil, but stayed there with it under the covers. Exorcist is a supernatural horror film based on the novel of the same name, which was based on a supposedly true story. More on that later. The movie tells the story mm. of a young girl named Reagan, who becomes possessed by a demon named Pazuzu. In a fight for Reagan's soul, her mother, movie star Chris McNeil, enlists the help of two priests. Catholic priest Lancaster Marin has seen his share of otherworldly things, while the younger father, Damien Karras, has come to question his faith. 
starring Ellen Burstyn, Jason Miller, Linda Blair, Max von Sydow, and Lee J. Cobb. The Exorcist was I thought it was Sydow. Uh, maybe I was wrong. Oh, by the way, rest in peace, William uh, Friedkin. Friedkin, um, he passed away not long ago. Such a, a huge loss. The guy obviously was a mad talent, and you know, The Exorcist is by far my favorite film from him. Oh, it's so like I could probably rave about The Exorcist all day. There's no need to because we already know what I think. It's just a phenomenal flick, and you know, William Fry, uh, Friedkin. And I always want to say Friedkin. Friedkin. Um, he he obviously his touch on the film obviously was just a big big part, and uh, uh, the performances top notch. Definitely, definitely movies that you wish you'd see more of. And, and it's it's sad because there's some films in the world today that I think could have gone uh, at the Academy Awards, like movies that I think should have been nominated that are horror movies. I can list a few of them off the top of my head. The Babadook, the performance by the main actress, insanely good. Uh, it should have been nominated for an Academy Award. It was that good. It was that convincing. It was that, wow. It was, it was great. Uh, the Witch by Robert Eggers. Hell, The Lighthouse. I think should have been nominated for a couple of more Academy Awards. It was obviously nominated for like one Academy Award for I think best uh, cinematography, but I think it should have been nominated for even more than that. I think it was just a, a very well made movie. It 2017 I feel like should have been nominated for an Academy Award. I'm not sure where, but I feel like it should have been there. Makeup and special effects maybe. Makeup for Pennywise I thought was so good. Such a unique look uh, for that character, especially coming off Tim Curry, who is like arguably. In my well, my personal opinion, is still the best Pennywise, and still my favorite looking Pennywise too, because he comes off like a clown. But it takes a, a it takes such a, a massive amount of of talent and creativity to come up with something that is by itself very cool and unique and a standout, and and different from Tim Curry's Pennywise, which I thought they did so good at. And and though I don't think any kid would be drawn towards a clown like that, in all honesty, it was too kind of creepy. Still, it was unique. And it was it, again. It felt like it felt like some sort of creature trying to impersonate a clown, but not getting it exactly right. And I kind of like that about the 2017 movie. But I still, have, it chapter one should have been nominated for some sort of Academy Award, specifically in makeup, I think, because that was still really good. And and you know, clothing and and whatnot, wardrobe. Yeah, there are so many horror films today that just are not getting the recognition, and it's just simply because the Academy don't want to nominate horror films, and it takes channels like Dead Meat to try to show that we appreciate horror films just as much as the next genre movie. And this is not a bad movie, but I'm not going to sit here and say, you know, Megan should have been nominated for Academy Award or like Pooh, Blood and Honey or things like that. Obviously not. But there are some that are just gems. It Follows was fucking phenomenal. It was a good movie. Very John Carpenter-esque. It just, it bums me out because you really, really wish some more of these films would get recognition. Friedkin, and written by William Peter Blatty, who also wrote the novel the movie is based upon. The Exorcist would go on to be a box office hit, scaring plenty of moviegoers around the world. It remains one of Warner Brothers' top 100 grossing films of all time. That's awesome. If only this show was about horror movies that overcame the odds and became super successful. It's not, though. At the heart of The Exorcist is a real story about a little boy possessed by a demon. It is one hell of a foundation to build a movie on, or a novel for that matter. By the time writer William Peter Blatty wrote The Exorcist, he was already an established comedic author, but he couldn't stop thinking about something he had read about nearly 20 years prior when he was at Georgetown University. In 1949, during his junior year of college, Blatty, a devout Catholic, read a story in the Washington Post. It was about a 14-year-old boy named Roland Dove, later revealed to be Ronald Edwin Hunkler, who was allegedly the victim of demonic possession. Blatty wanted the story to be the nucleus for his next book, but kept meeting dead ends when it came to actual evidence that could support the story. And if he didn't have the conviction that the story was real, he didn't want to write it at all. His breakthrough came in the form of the diary of one of the priests who had attended the exorcism of Dove. Blatty found the detailed and meticulous account to be beyond a doubt convincing and thus proceeded with the book. And then, as in many Hollywood stories, the best-selling book was optioned into a movie just two years later. Before production could begin, they needed the perfect cast and director. This would prove to be its own kind of hell. When it came to his novel, Blatty had made minor changes to the allegedly factual story. He made the possessed victim younger and changed the gender from a boy to a girl. The priests were given their own backstories, and the young girl's mother was turned into a movie star. For these parts and others, the studio wanted big name stars. They also wanted to pick the director, 
Arthur Penn, Stanley Kubrick, and Mike Nichols Wait. were all... The director in that movie, the one who, you know, dies, I want to go ahead and quote one of his uh, scenes really quick. So, what's for dessert? I don't know why I wanted to do that, but... <laughs> Such a dick. Offered the job, but they all turned it down. I'll for kill you. Reasons. Eventually, Mark Rydell was signed on as director, but writer Blatty wanted someone else. He wanted William Friedkin. Although the studio initially scoffed at the idea, in the end, they backed down, and Friedkin was brought aboard. After that, the hunt for the cast began. In Friedkin's 2013 memoir, The Friedkin Connection, oh. the director goes into detail about his casting struggles. Originally, for the role of movie star and mother, Chris McNeil, the studio had in mind Audrey Hepburn, Anne Bancroft, or Jane Fonda. Friedkin explains that he and Blatty were both fine with Hepburn. The actress reacted favorably to the offer, but would require them to shoot in Rome, since that's where she was living at the time. Friedkin said that that would be too difficult and asked her to reconsider, but she declined. And so, there would be no exorcism at Tiffany's. Damn, so I, I'm sure she probably, I'm not sure if she regrets that till this day, and I'm not sure if she, you know, she's still around or not. But man, could you imagine turning like that down, like a movie project like that down, and then realizing years later it's become one of the biggest fucking horror movies ever to exist? Like, The Exorcist is up there with movies like John Carpenter's Halloween and Jaws as like the top tier ho more like horror movies of all time. Imagine losing that opportunity, which is one of the reasons why if ever there was ever a moment where somebody would want to reach out to me and have me a part of their horror film, which it has happened before, and I do apologize, I never got back to them. They were filming in Kentucky, which is not that far away from me. I should have gone, gosh dang it. You know, there's a part of me that wishes. Uh, if you never need any voice, and the reason why I had to turn it down is because obviously I, I, my personal life right now is just so busy. Um, it, I, I have to like be here. So unfortunately, I have to turn down some certain things, but I, I really regret doing that. I mean, some people have actually reached out to me and still reach out to me today, wanting me to be part of these collaborations, and I just can't do it all the time, not right now at least. I got to make the time to do it. So my deepest apologies to anybody who wants to reach out to me and like gets me, give me a part of their investigations or collaborations or films or short films or whatever. I will tell you that right now, I can do voice acting from my place, but I can do voices if you want me to. So reach out to me if you want any voiceover for anything, like you're making a horror movie, maybe you want a voice in someone's head or something, I might be able to pull that off. So uh, reach out to me if you want that. Send me a script and everything, and I'll do that. Uh, I'm always down to be a part of someone's project. I, I love that stuff. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, just wanted to throw that out there because I, I actually have had a couple people reach out to me these past couple nights, and I'm actually saying, hey, you want to be a part of a paranormal investigation? And I'm like, um, I haven't gotten back to those people yet, so you're probably going to see it here. But I, I want to say to you that uh, depending on when and the timing is mainly where it is and uh, where it is for me. Because, again, I'm trying to buy a house right now. I have, you know, family here. I got uh, the timing. I mean, a job. I mean, YouTube. I mean, there's just so much I got to do. We will see. We will see, of course. I, I definitely do not take it out of the question. It will be a possibility at some point. I just got to make the time for it. So I'll see myself out. Anne Bancroft was next in line and was also interested in the role, but asked that filming be pushed back a year since she was pregnant. Friedkin and Blatty said no. Then came perhaps the most prolific rebuff from the badass Jane Fonda. After Fonda read the script, Friedkin says she sent a telegram stating, Why would anyone want to make this piece of capitalist ripoff bullshit? We wow, how wrong she was. Again, dude, again, some of the, like, the ignorant comments made about certain films, like give it a chance, right? Like give the movie a chance. You never know. I mean, again, some people might read certain scripts and be like, you know, this isn't for me and that's fine, but you don't have to be so disrespectful about it. People have passions, people have projects they wanna make and look, you know, show them respect. If you don't wanna do the movie, all you have to say is no, I'm just not interested, it's not for me. Uh, I hope you find somebody, not for me. That's all you had to say. You don't have to be so mean about it. God. Love a queen who tells us how she really feels, okay? Fonda would later clarify to Friedkin that she didn't want to do the film because she didn't believe in magic. Ellen Burstyn, who would eventually nab the role, was at first a hard sell to both the studio and Friedkin, but she was her own strongest advocate, calling the director and telling him that playing Chris McNeil was her destiny. When Friedkin brought up wow. Burstyn to Ted Ashley, the chairman of Warner Brothers Studio, Ashley was vehemently against the idea. According to Friedkin, Ashley fumed in his office and furiously yelled, I'm not giving the lead in this picture to a woman who's never played a lead in anything. Oh my gosh. God, the ignorance. <laughs> Jesus. 
That's how you find amazing actors by giving them the shot. Oh my god. Um, let's okay, Jamie Lee Curtis. She was in a couple of things, I think, before Halloween, but Halloween really kickstarted her career. I mean, let's be real, it really brought her to the forefront for a lot of other projects, and now she's one of the most beloved actresses of all time. Now, obviously, at the time, this was not something like, you know, common, I guess. Today, it's more common, obviously, than back then. You know, just people who normally would not get leading roles will probably never get leading roles ever. Unfortunately, they should be given chances, I think. Uh, we need we can get more movie actors out there, movie actresses and, and whatnot, but for some reason... People just don't want to give people opportunities. We'd rather get somebody that we're just so used to seeing instead of giving people fair shots. Like right now, you know, Tom Holland. Everybody likes Tom Holland, and he's a great actor. But he's all he's in everything now because people just don't want to take risks anymore. Take some risks. Get some good actors, you know? And I, I understand that, you know, there's millions of dollars that go into it, and you really don't want to waste your opportunity. And look, if you start filming... And it just doesn't work out. It doesn't work out. Or during, you know, your reads. Just, if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. But you be, might be surprised on who you find, who you uncover. And you can say, I'm the one who found that kid. I'm the one who gave them a shot. And that's awesome. I'm glad that their career's going off. But you'd rather just play it safe. And I think that's happening too much now as films are playing it safe anymore. Ellen Burstyn will play this part over my dead body. Ted Ashley. Yikes. The studio had no other choices and eventually approved her. When it came to casting Father Lancaster Marin, the studio wanted Marlon Brando. Friedkin was immediately against this idea because he didn't want it to become a Brando movie. The role wouldn't- He gets it. He understands. Unfortunately, like, there are a lot of people who view certain movies as, oh, that's just a Jim Carrey movie, or that's just a Marlon Brando, or maybe, like, some other popular Tom Hanks movie or something like that. It's not even about the story anymore. It's just about, this is Marlon Brando's movie, or this is Tom Hanks's movie, or this is uh, Tim Allen's movie. It's not even about the movie anymore. It's just about the performance and that huge actor being a part of it. It's not, and I think that's what he was aiming for, is he wanted the movie to be about the story, about the suspense, the terror, which came with this concept. Now, this guy was a class A director. Instead, go to Swedish actor Max von Sydow. For father Damien Karras, Jack Nicholson, Paul Newman, and Roy Scheider were all considered. Jack Gladdy Nicholson? ended up hiring Stacey Keach, who signed a contract and everything. But fate would intervene and give us a different actor in the part. Friedkin came across Jason Miller in New York when the actor was performing in a play called That Championship Season. He thought the actor might be good for the part of Father Karras. But their initial meeting didn't go well, and production moved on. Sometime later, Freakin received a call from Miller that he detailed in his memoir. I read that book you told me about, that exorcist. That guy is me. What guy? Father Karras. Oh, well, I appreciate your interest, but we've signed an actor. <laughs> well, I'm telling you I am that guy. Will you at least shoot a screen test with me? No, no, we've cast the role. I don't care. You don't care? Friedkin impressed with Miller's fuck. boldness. I don't care. Screen test, and he got the part. That took guts. With many of the That's other so roles sad. Still That's so sad for whoever had the part before him. I actually kind of feel bad now. Like, don't get me wrong. Miller. Oh, my God. Uh, arguably, probably, like, I know people like to talk about Reagan. He was fucking awesome in The Exorcist. It came time to cast the pivotal part of Reagan, the possessed young girl at the center of the story. For over four months, Friedkin, Blatty, and company auditioned a thousand girls. They even increased the age of the character in hopes of finding the right young actress who would be able to handle such a grueling role. A 13-year-old Jamie Lee Curtis was considered. No but shit. her mother, famed actress Janet Lee, said no. One day, Linda Blair's mother showed up to Friedkin's office. Okay. Janet Lee told them no for this movie. I won't lie, that's understandable. I do not blame any parent for saying no to this movie. Basically because of, you know, what transpires in the movie, of course, you know, involving the kid. Like, it is some pretty next-level dark stuff. And she was in Psycho, but this was like, uh, this is a kid first off, and they are experiencing, I mean, crazy... I mean, there's literally a scene where she's literally shoving a crucifix up herself. I mean, the second I would have read that in the script, if it was even in the script, I'm, I'm sure it was, I, I don't know. I would have been very hesitant myself, and I probably honestly would have made the same decision. I probably would have been like, no, my kid's not going to be involved with this. Like, I, I just can't do that. I, I just can't. It, that's a lot. Uh, it, 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 I get it. I do. 
Uh, I wouldn't have blamed even Linda Linda Blair's parents for even turning that down. But at the same time, it's like you know, good on that, good on them. I mean, they kickstarted a career for her, right? Um, that's that's the plus. But at the same time, too, it's like this was major shit being played out on a screen without an appointment, hoping the director would meet with her daughter. According to Friedkin, Blair seemed unperturbed about the movie's material and what her character had to do. That was good enough for him. They had found their Reagan. It wasn't just the script that great. had demonic forces and injuries. The set had plenty of that stuff too. By the time they began filming in 1972, Friedkin had developed a reputation of pushing his actors to their limits. The Exorcist proved to be no different. In a short behind the scenes documentary about the film, by Owen Roisman, who was the lead cinematographer on The Exorcist, it was shown that Friedkin had a few unorthodox ways of getting the reactions he wanted from his stars. Often, without warning, the director would shoot off guns on set to evoke startled reactions. Friedkin would later claim he was inspired by director George Stevens. While filming the 1959 Oscar-winning film, The Diary of Anne Frank, Stevens regularly shot pistols to get his crew into the nerve-wracked state he desired. Quite the movie to pull that shit on. As for Friedkin, one time, he wanted to get a particular emotion from the late father, William O'Malley, who played Father Dreyer in the film. His director's toolbox must have run out because he resorted to slapping the actor across the face without warning and then rolling film on the cameras. The abuse didn't stop there either. During the scene where Reagan slaps her mother, Burstyn complained that she was getting pulled across the room too hard by special effects supervisor Marcel Vacuter. Friedkin told the actress he would have it fixed, but instead encouraged Vacuter to pull Burstyn harder. The actress was yanked violently across the room, landed on her tailbone, and screamed in real pain. This was the shot that Friedkin used in the movie. The actress was left on crutches for the rest of production. Although, yeah, I, yeah, there, there's, there's a part of me that obviously is not for that. I understand, like, why they would probably pull something like that to get the best shot they can get, but. I mean, this is, you're really hurting people. This isn't like a game. You could literally paralyze somebody or actually really hurt them by pulling that shit. I mean, it looks like she actually hit her head against the wall. I mean, you're lucky that didn't cause like a concussion or something like that. I mean, seriously. Or maybe she went back far enough, she hit the window and sh got stabbed by glass. I mean, that can actually happen. Accidents can happen. I understand, you know, wanting to push your actors and wanting to do stuff for them. Um, but they honestly, in my personal opinion, I think should be, they have to be okay with it. Don't just fucking walk up and smack someone upside the face because you feel like you're paying them. It's not good. It's not, some, certainly if I was a director, that's not something I would do. A ever. Um, I would never lay my hand on anybody for the sake of getting a shot. Right? I would make it work to the best of my abilities, but I would never put them in physical pain or harm. That That's just something that, you know would not fly with me, especially if I was on set. I probably would have said something, and I probably would have gotten fired, honestly. Friedkin would dispute Burstyn's claim that she was badly injured. It's no wonder that Burstyn would go on to say in a later interview that Friedkin was a maniac and that the actions he took were beyond what anyone needs to do to make a movie. In fact, there were many firings and resignations of crew members who didn't care for Friedkin's tactics. Mm. One of those tactics was keeping the set refrigerated to see the character's breath during the exorcism. Temperatures could go well below freezing. And while the crew wore heavy coats and hats, young Linda Blair was left in nothing but the thin nightgown she wears in the movie. When it came to Blair's makeup, the actress would later recall that the glue they used to put on the prosthetics burned her skin. If freezing temps and skin burns weren't bad enough, the young actress was also severely injured while on set. During the exorcism scenes, Blair was strapped into a harness so she could be jerked around violently. I heard instance, about this. I heard about that. Yep. Apparently, didn't it like dislocate her back or something? Like because they were pulling her back and forth so much, like it actually caused real physical pain. Don't get me wrong. Obviously, the film is a masterpiece. It's, it's phenomenal. And I'm not going to take that away from anybody who was involved because... Let's face it, the movie really was a massive success, and they should all be extremely proud of what they have done to accomplish that movie and everything on it. There are obviously some things I do not agree with, certainly things I would never put a young actor in. I just, I, I wouldn't do it. I would not risk causing serious damage to a, anybody's bodies, especially a kid that I'm hiring to be on the set. Like, I, 
I would not want to do that. That 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 to me would break my fucking heart. I would probably burst out into tears if I found out I actually caused this kid like serious damage. I'd be like, fuck my life. The straps came loose from the harness, and the young actress was thrashed about so violently that she ended up fracturing her lower fracturing. spine. Once again, the footage in which this accident occurred was used in the film. Blair and Burstyn ended up with chronic back pain that still affects them today. On top of all of this, the cast and crew were convinced that the set was haunted, for good reason. During production, a number of the cast, including Linda Blair and Max von Sydow, lost family members. Also, the son of Jason Miller had a near-fatal motorcycle accident during filming. At one point, the entire set of the McNeil household caught on fire, except the room belonging to the demon-possessed Reagan, for some reason. The fire delayed filming for six weeks and was seen as such a bad omen, a priest was asked to bless the set. Despite the grueling production, filming eventually wrapped and the exorcist was released onto the world. And the world was not ready. Initially, the studio had little faith in the film and they only gave it a limited theatrical release. But soon, large lines began to grow outside of the theater showing it and Warner Brothers decided to give it a wider release. As the film's success began to rise, so did the controversy. Some critics felt that the movie should be rated X instead of R. Conspiracy theories were spread that the Motion Pictures Association of America's rating board had given in to pressure by the studio to give the film an R rating. Although there is no evidence to prove this occurred. In Mississippi and the United Kingdom, there were protests to have the film banned from being shown. Barf bags were given out during screenings due to the high volume of audience members who became physically ill while watching the movie. Allegedly, one woman passed out and broke her jaw while watching. Jesus she then Christ. proceeded to sue Warner Brothers, claiming it was the film's subliminal messages that caused her to faint and injure herself. It was a wild claim, but WB settled out of court with her to avoid a trial. Then you had Linda Blair at the center of it all, and not everyone was kind to the young actress. For six months after the release of The Exorcist, the studio had to hire bodyguards for Blair due to the death threats she received from religious zealots who felt that her portrayal of Reagan glorified Satan. In a 2016 interview with Own God, isn't Magazine, that fucked up? That adults cannot tell the difference between a director making those choices or a writer making those choices and an actress making those choices. It kind of goes to say it kind of is the same for like people who go out to like fast food places. They blame the employees, but they don't fucking blame the people responsible. Fast food places, uh, you know, they'd, they'd rather blame uh, the, the person at the register instead of the manager or the supervisor who should be supervising everything. They would rather be blaming um, the people at Walmart, you know. Again, register people, employees who are walking on the floor, just minding their own business, and they all, like, I know we're start getting yelled at because they have to point their finger at somebody. And the fact that they were sending, sending death threats to a child, a child actress, is extremely, extremely, extremely low. Yeah, coming from people who say that they are very religious and, and good people. Yeah, sending death threats to a kid. Blair explained how challenging that time in her life was. She said, The Exorcist was so controversial, so of course I am at the very pinnacle of all that, so it all became my fault. The Exorcist made horror And it history, wasn't. But that it wasn't. You were just an actress doing her job. No. If anybody should have been blamed, it should have been the studio. But, right? The studio and, and the filmmakers, not the actresses, not the... That's crazy, though, that to find out that she was sent death, death threats, which at the same time, it's not crazy because people are stupid. People are idiots. That notoriety came with a price. In addition to its chaotic production, a curse supposedly followed it. Shortly after filming Wrapped, Jack McGowan, who played the film director, Burke Dennings, died in real life from complications with influenza. Vasiliki Maliaros, who played Father Karras' mother, passed away before The Exorcist hit the big screen. If that wasn't creepy enough, it turns out... To be fair, she didn't look really all too young either. So, um, yeah, it was a very strange coincidence that she had to pass away before the film's release, but she did look like she was up there in age. And I could be wrong. I'm not sure how old she was when she, she passed, but she looked like she was up there. One of the actors in the film ended up being a real-life convicted murderer. I'm talking about Paul Bateson. He appeared as a radiology technician in perhaps one of the most realistic scenes in the movie, dealing with the medical uh, test yeah. Reagan had to go through as her possession progressed. In September 1977, 
Four years after the exorcist, a man named Addison Barrow was found beaten and stabbed to death in his Greenwich Village apartment. Barrow had been a reporter for Variety and also an out gay man. When his murder received little to no national press, a reporter from the publication The Village Voice, Arthur Bell, called out media's lack of concern for the safety of those in the gay community. After publishing his article, he supposedly received a call from an anonymous person claiming to have killed Barrow. Paul Bateson was eventually brought in for the murder. Bateson denied the killings, but the evidence was against him, and he was sentenced to 20 years in prison. There were reports that while in prison, Bateson confessed to more murders of gay men, but no further charges were brought against him due to the lack of evidence. Was he a serial killer? We may never know. Bateson was released from prison in 2003 after nearly 24 years. Since that time, his whereabouts are unknown. Holy Cursed shit, that's terrifying. Or just unbelievably creepy coincidences. So he's just out there. Nobody knows where he is. I mean, he could be passed away by now, but like, oh gosh, that's a uh, pretty Perhaps, unsettling. As some have argued, the studio played into the creepy controversy in order to gain more attention for the film. No matter the case, the hype is justified because The Exorcist holds real substance and cultural importance. It made mainstream film organizations take horror movies a bit more seriously, and the material and topic still resonates with many today, half a century later. The Exorcist seemed like hell to make and dealt with literal hell on top of it. The results are a pretty iconic movie. I'm Chauncey K. Robinson, and this has been Production Tales from Hell. Stay creepy out there. Thank you. Okay, so yeah, The Exorcist, no question, phenomenal film. Uh, th this movie is gold. It it's so good. There's a lot of things I did not know. I did not know Linda Blair received death threats. That's something I was completely unaware of. I did not know there was a, a supposed serial killer who actually did go on to commit crimes and actually murdered somebody. I, I had no idea. That stuff was really new to me. The stuff I did know about was Linda Blair damaging her back, uh, fracturing it. I did know about... Well, I'm surprised they actually didn't mention the whole thing with uh, the guy who played Father Karras. There was actually a scene, and I guess it's not really that big of a deal because it's not really all that scary. It was just a, a funny moment. Uh, basically, where Reagan is spewing up her vomit, it actually comes out too hard and shoots him in the face. That was an accident. And when he pulled the stuff off, you know, he went along with the scene and everything, but that is the, the moment they kept in the movie because it was actually the most convincing thing. And But when I find out the director would do this to his actors... Was it really an accident or was it on purpose just to get a better reaction out of the actor? I don't know, but I'm kind of leaning in towards more of the idea that the director may have hinted at the idea that he wanted the stuff to hit him in the face. I could be wrong about that, but that, that happened. And apparently he was very, Jason Miller, he was very pissed off. He was like not happy at all that that hit him in the face, but it does look good on film. Having said that, uh, I, I feel like I did hear about the actor getting slapped in the face. And I, of course, I don't agree with that. I still think that is just you poor directing making honestly like obviously this guy was a, a, a genius behind the camera but there's some things obviously that i would be like yeah that's probably something i would not do uh maybe grabbing the actress and like throwing her against the wall for the sake of the movie not really something i would want to do i would not want to damage anybody i would not want to hurt anybody uh even for the sake of catching it on camera having said that there are still some i mean the movie itself is just a genius it, the movie is phenomenal and if you have not seen the exorcist and you're worried to see it I highly recommend watching it, especially if you have not seen it. It is, to my, in my opinion, it is top 20, top 10 best horror films I've ever seen in my life. And I still continuously watch it till this day because I just keep finding new things about it that I like even more. So having said that, guys, let me know your thoughts down in the comments section. What did you think of this? Did you guys, uh, do you guys agree with me? Do you guys disagree with me? Do you guys dis uh, agree with them? Do you guys disagree with them? Let me know in the comment section down below. Which one would you like me to do next? Again, get this video up to 100 likes and I will continue reacting to these production tales from hell because I'm really enjoying them because I love horror films and this is just, I eat, I, I eat this shit up. So anyways, guys, I'll see you in the next one. Do take care.
If you call the cuts, three cuts, starts is through You won't be letting down